here at City Church, we exist to help people find their way to God from where they are, and we do that by practicing the way of Jesus together here in Boulder. And so no matter where you're walking in on your spiritual journey, you are loved, you're safe, you're welcome here. We're so glad you're here, and our, our heart is simply to help you, uh, to meet you where you are and help you take some next steps, hopefully toward Jesus. So we're going to get into week two, and today is an interesting message. God gave me this message a couple of weeks ago, um, and as I was prepping for it, I was praying over our church. I was uh, serving at another church in Dallas a couple of weeks ago as well and praying over them. And God, what do you want to speak to our church in the Christmas season and, and this church over here in the Christmas season? What are we going to do? And I kept hitting this wall like nothing, like just, it was, I mean, I could have talked like a lot of good things, but nothing like this is it. And then over the course of just praying and, and having nothing, then God finally reveals to me, hey, actually, I don't have a message for City Church, I don't have a message for Rev Church where I was at in Dallas, but I have a message for you. And so the good news for you is you might be off the hook today, but I get to share with you what God's been doing in my life, and this might or might not help you. Is that cool? So today is the Christmas message that I didn't know I needed, <laughs> and hopefully it'll be that for you as well. So let's start this way uh, with a little story. Two young fish are swimming along like they do. And they pass an older, wiser fish. And as he passes them, he looks at them and he says, Good morning, boys. How's the water? And the two young fish keep swimming and they kind of give him a little nod. And as they get a little bit out of ear's distance, one of the younger fish leans over to the other one and says, What is water? Everybody, you tracking with me? <laughs> I got like a little bit of a chuckle and then I, What? This is uh, a little story by David Foster Wallace that's, that's meant to communicate a reality, specifically the truth that the most obvious and important realities in our lives, the most obvious and important realities in our lives are often the hardest to see and to talk about. What is water? Sometimes the most obvious and important realities of my life and your life are the hardest to see and the most difficult to talk about. You guys tracking with me? So I'm praying over this space, praying over that story. God, what are you trying to help me realize? What's the water that I'm swimming in that I'm not paying attention to? And so I, be I began to reflect. Uh, back in September, I was in India. And we have some partners. We have partners kind of all over India. But I was in northern India um, and and honestly, guys, it was like the most mind-blowing trip I've been on to date. So seven days on the ground. Uh, some of you have heard some of the stories, um, and for like security reasons, I can't share names and pictures and things like that, but I mean, it was mind-boggling. I heard stories prior to going, and I was like, wow, these stories are amazing. And then I'm on the ground, and God is just blowing my mind. They've seen... Um, over 80,000 churches planted in the area that we were in over the last 10 years, which is wild. They've seen over a million people give their lives to Jesus and be baptized over the last 10 years. While we were there in one day, we baptized 384 people just in one, like, one, two hour session. Just like, it was, it was crazy. There's four of us in a tank and they're just like throwing people in there. I mean, it was wild. And on top of that, guys, like the power of God and, and like it's just normal people who love Jesus and he's changing their lives. But I mean, there's the miraculous everywhere. I mean, this person's been healed of cancer and this person was demon possessed and they're well and this person, their kid was sick and now they're well and this person's mom was dead and now she's alive. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? And it was amazing every time I turned around. And as we're in India, um, one, I mean, just traveling around the world, I mean, we're like crazy busy in, in a good way, like going from village to village and just, just long car rides. And so we're exhausted. You don't have good signal while you're out there either, especially like in between villages. So like you can't occupy, you know, the free space in the car with like your phone or anything like that. You just kind of are sitting in the back of this car going like this the whole time, trying to throw up. And it's great. Um, and so, so we're doing that. One of the ways, by the way, that we passed time um, in the cars from village to village was, you know, we're talking about amazing things that God is doing, but also we also had really like deep spiritual conversations around Chuck Norris jokes. So um, it was really, can I give you one just to, I got my favorite one of the entire trip. You ready? Okay. So I heard that they tried to make a Chuck Norris toilet paper, but it didn't work out because it wouldn't take crap from anybody. <laughs> It's so good. 
That's not, I got like a couple giggles and others of you are like, I'm so disappointed right now. I, listen, that was the best one of the whole car ride. Anyway, all right, so I'm in India and it's amazing, guys. I mean, flipping everything, I mean, like, it's incredible. And listen, there are people that are normal just like me and you that God is working through in amazing ways. I mean, there's this, I'm in a room with like a hundred of their leaders and like there's this half blind dude that's planted nine churches. There's this lady in her 60s who's planted like 57 churches. And I mean, it's just unbelievable the stuff that God is doing and it's humbling and, and I just feel like my faith is increasing. I'm like, wow, like, like God, you are who you say you are. You can do the things that you say you, you'll do. And so I'm just trying to get out of my own way and listen. And I feel like I get on this super like clear, one of the things that happened while I was there is I felt like in the process, a lot of like distraction and a lot of like just the busyness of life was kind of falling off, right? I was just kind of laser focused, saturated in this context for seven days and um, Chuck Norris do- jokes were helping, but you know, I'm not, not, not on my phone and on social media. I'm just like present to all the things that are happening around me. And um, I feel like I start to hear God more clearly for the first time in my life than I ever have. I mean, I've heard God periodically throughout my life of following Jesus, but um, it's like he started to speak really clearly, and I started to hear even more clearly. And, and what I have found is God is often speaking. We just have a hard time listening. And so I'm just like on cloud nine. And I come back from India, and I'm a little nervous, like, like that, I'm going to come back and lose it all, right? I'm like, oh, this is amazing. I don't and so we get back, and honestly, it doesn't fall off. Like, I mean, we get back, and Danielle, you can ask Danielle, my wife, and she would tell you, like, the drink that came back from India was a different dude. Like, some God had shifted some things in my heart and mind, and I'm, I'm living different, and I'm acting different, and there's, there's just different things happening. And um, if you guys remember, following that moment, uh, we also walked into a, a season of a 24-hour prayer movement as a church. And that was incredible, was it not? We put our hands together for that. I mean, it was unbelievable, right? Like 24-7 prayer nonstop for a week straight. It was crazy. And so God's doing all kinds of cool stuff. And while I'm in that prayer room at 2 a.m. listening to God, I mean, it's like he keeps speaking. And I'm like, this is it. I, this I could do for the rest of my life. And then Monday rolls around after the prayer room. And it's like I ran into a brick wall. You ever had one of those moments? Like you just wake up and it's like everything on life hit the rakes. Bam! And I'm like, what is going on? And it was this, I have no, I, I, I was having a really hard time identifying. Like, like, I felt really, really stuck. Heart, mind, just really cluttered and stuck. You guys ever been there? And e- even if it's not spiritual, right? Where you just kind of get in a funk. You ever felt funky, but not in a good way? You know, not like dance floor funky, but like, like things are not right. And you've taken a shower, so you know it's not that. But you're like, what is going on with me? And it was so much so that Danielle began to notice. And she's like the, the thermometer, like she, she can tell what's going on, right? And so she's like, what's going on with you? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm mad about it, right? It was really hard. It was frustrating. And so I, I'm carrying that funk, like post prayer room all the way through, going Thanksgiving, all of that stuff. And then I'm getting ready to give this message in Dallas. I'm like, God, what is it that you want to do? And as I'm praying over this message, this is what God brings me to today. That sometimes the most obvious and important realities are often the hardest to see and the most difficult to talk about. And I feel like uh, uh, Richard Foster captures the the space that my heart was in very well. So I'm going to give you this quote first as we talk about the diagnosis. Oh, do I have that quote from? Oh, you can go on. (laughs) This is from last week. Next slide. And one more. Yeah, there it is. Sorry, guys. Um, Okay, so Richard Foster captures it well. He says, the pace of the modern world accentuates our sense of being fractured and fragmented. We feel strained, hurried, and breathless. The complexity of rushing to achieve and to accumulate more and more threatens frequently to overwhelm us, and it seems there is no escape from the rat race. How's that feel? Familiar? Like, no, not for me, but I see it on you, Drake, (laughs) right? And as I read this, I, I, I get the question in the back of my mind, Drake, how's the water? Right, this is the water. This is the water that we live in. You can go back for a sec. This is the water that we live in. While I'm in India, I ask the, the, the leader of that movement, I say, hey, what, what do you see as like the primary difference between what, what God's doing here and, and then what we're experiencing in the West? and some of the struggles that we have. And he said two things. Number one, he said, we have, uh, you have distractions that we don't have here in India. 
So it's one of the competing factors with your heart, with your mind, with busyness, with consumerism, materialism, success, up and to the right, all of that. You have distractions that we don't have. And the second thing he said is that here in India, we name our gods. And he said, you have just as many gods, you just don't give them a name. I was like, wow, that's not as encouraging as I thought it was going to be. But there's some really helpful truth there. How's, how's the water? And on the other side of it, we're asking, what is water? Because we're swimming in it. You're like, what in the world does this have to do with Christmas? I'm getting there, okay? Here we are. Last week, um, we, we picked up a very simple process of the Christmas story being this incredible message that God is love, that God is with us, but also, if we're not careful, he's easy to miss. Now today, I want to take you to the continuation of that Christmas story in John, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter 3. So John, the cousin of Jesus, is sent ahead of Jesus to help people recognize that God has been secreted in. So there's this incredible Christmas story happening that most people are missing, and John is proclaiming and letting people know, hey, get your hearts ready. He's calling people to prepare their hearts for the coming Messiah, the one that they've been leaning into, looking forward to this incredible Savior to not only save from sin, but to give new life and to set people free. And as he's calling people, to, the word he uses is, is repentance, to change the way that they think, to prepare their hearts and minds for what's coming. They respond, the crowds that are with John, they respond, this is post-Jesus' birth, and, and they say, then what should we do? Now listen, this is, this is post-Jesus' birth, still in the Christmas story, and in response, they're, they're, there's this leaning in of their hearts, Advent, waiting, the arrival, they're looking forward, they're leaning in, they're waiting for this moment, and they say, so what should we do as we prepare? And here's how John responds. He answers them and he says, whoever has two tunics, share with the one who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. What? (laughs) That's how you want me to get ready for Jesus? That's how you want me to get ready for the Christmas season? You want me to prepare my heart by talking to me about my closet and my refrigerator? Like, Like, how does this come together? And this is the most unlikely Christmas message that I didn't know I needed. He goes on. And he says, tax collectors, they also came to be baptized. And they said, teacher, what what should we do? And he said, collect no more than you're authorized to do. Soldiers asked him the same. What should we do? And he said to them, don't extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, but be content with your, uh, your wages. So John's message to a world leaning in, awaiting to celebrate the arrival of this birth of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is check your closets and your refrigerators. Pay attention. There might be some things crowding out your heart and mind that you're unaware of. That the invitation of simplicity and generosity might be a space that opens up our eyes to recognize the very God among us. So one of the things that I want to ask you and I today is, is it possible, just just a theoretical, probably not, But is it possible that having things, wanting things and pursuing stuff and having more can sometimes potentially maybe just a little bit distract you and your heart away from the life that you truly want? Is it possible? Is it possible that sometimes we're so busy and muddy with Instagram feeds and the busyness of the world around us and materialism and consumerism and the pursuit of more and adventures that we start to miss the life that we truly long for? Is it possible that John is making a connection between the eternal life that Jesus talks about, not just, not just somewhere that you go when you die, not a destination, but a life that you live right now. Is it possible that there's a connection between the truly good life and our relationship to money and stuff? That's a leading question because the Holy Spirit in the back of my mind has been asking me, hey Drake, how's the water? So is there a practice from the way of Jesus that opens up our lives to the things that truly matter, that helps us kind of get out of that muddied space that Foster was talking about, the strained, hurried, breathless pace that we have in the world around us, or to ask it another way? Is there a practice from the way of Jesus that gives us access into what Jesus called the truly good life? 
And that's a leading question because the answer is yes. So I want to sh- show a story in Luke 18 today of Jesus and his interaction with a young man to help us kind of process why John would invite us in the Advent season to take a look at our closets and our refrigerators. A certain ruler comes to Jesus asking, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I don't know what you hear when you hear that word, eternal life. This is not a question of how do I go to heaven when I die? That's, that's one of the, like, the, the natural defaults in the West. But the idea here, eternal life, this young man is asking, how do I experience life to the fullest, true life both now and later? Jesus would later talk about it uh, of, like it's in the age now and the age to come. So it's not absent of life after death, but it is so massively saturated in the life that you and I live every day that that's the priority. That's what we see most fully. And this young man comes to Jesus saying, hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And one of the things I think we need to realize is when God sends Jesus to earth, God is not so much trying to get people into heaven as he is trying to get heaven into people. He's trying to come and change our hearts from the inside out, and it becomes a reality that we live into. God is, is, uh, I'm sorry, in this moment, this young man has an understanding. One of the assumptions in the culture is that you, if you are financially well off, like this young man is, then it is assumed just by default that you are living the blessed life. You're living the good life. You have eternal life. And so this young man comes to Jesus, and Jesus is kind of like this, this renegade rabbi, right? Like, so they got lots of rabbis teaching the Torah, and so that's very familiar, but Jesus is on the scene, and he's teaching in a different way. He's honoring what's been said, but now he's calling out even more, and he's kind of ruffling some feathers, but also it's really intriguing. And so I imagine this young man comes to Jesus saying, hey, I've heard everybody else take on this. Jesus, what's your take on what it takes to have eternal life? And I think it's because this young man has, has everything he needs. He's got more than enough. And he's like, honestly, this, if this is it, this is not all that great. I mean, it's fine. I'm, I'm comfortable. I, I, I have all the stuff, but, but is this really it? Is this really the good life, eternal life? Is this as much as there is to be had? And then look at Jesus' response. Jesus says, no one is good except God alone, which is, I'm sorry, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. This is Jesus inviting him to consider who he's talking to. Jesus knows who he is, God in the flesh. But he's asking this young man, does he know who he's talking to? And then he goes on in verse 20. He says, you know the commandments. He would have grown up in them. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. Now Jesus is quoting the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten, which maybe you're familiar with, maybe you're not. But but do you notice anything missing out of Jesus' list as he gives the commandments to this young man? Hey, you know these. You notice anything missing? Like four of them? (laughs) Like there's ten and he only gave six? Like You're like, oh, okay. So this is interesting. Jesus responds, he says, hey, you know the commands. Look how the young man responds in verse 21. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. So so what we need to pay attention to is not so much what Jesus says, but what is not said in this moment. That Jesus quotes some of the Ten Commandments, but he only quotes the ones that have to do with our behavior to neighbor. So if if you don't know about the Ten Commandments, right, they're they're these big ten, they're generally good ideas, right, like don't kill anybody, don't cheat on your wife, generally agreed upon good things, right? And so we have these big ten commandments, and Jesus highlights the six that are oriented around our relationship to neighbor. Half of them are, or four of them are our relationship with God, and the other six are our relationship to people around us. And so Jesus focuses on the six and leaves out the ones in relation to God. And it's equally important what Jesus is not saying as what he has said. What Jesus is saying is, hey, you're keeping all the rules. You have all of the outward, like, yeah, I'm doing the things, but your heart's not in it. There's something missing. You've got all the external. You're playing the game. You're doing the right things. And that's, that's kind of how I thought about Jesus before I met him. Like kind of be a good person, live a good life, and go to heaven when I die or whatever my assumptions were before I met Jesus at, at 15. But this young man is playing all the right rules on the outside, but Jesus is saying something about his heart. The ones that are all about our devotion to God He says, hey, you're you're keeping all the rules, but your heart is divided. So then look at Jesus' response. Jesus heard the young man, and he said, 
you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Whoa. It's a good thing that's for him and not us, right? You're like, all right, good deal. Sucks to be that guy, (laughs) right? In this moment, Jesus is asking a really big question that we need to consider. What is competing? And listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this is an invitation for you to wrestle with who Jesus is and what he invites you into when it comes to relationship. But if you're a follower of Jesus, the question is, what is competing in my heart with undivided devotion to Jesus? What what are the things in my life that are blurring my vision? Where am I missing it? Where am I distracted? There's a principle here that we should not miss. Jesus is not just saying, hey, yeah, money and stuff, give those things away because it's all bad for you. Not at all, not at all. We'll get to that in a minute. But rather, the principle is Jesus invites us to freely give away anything and everything that competes with our undivided attention and devotion to him. I'll say it again. The principle here that we should not miss is an invitation to freely give away anything and everything that competes with our undivided attention and devotion to him. And then look at the young man's response. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Or another translation of that Greek could be he had many possessions. And so Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is acknowledging in this moment the competition that money and stuff and the pursuit of more has with the human condition, the competition of our hearts between trusting in money and stuff and success and our relationship with Jesus. He said how hard it is. So two questions that you and I should be asking as a result of this story and an interaction with Jesus, as we consider John's words. You wanna get your heart ready for the Christmas season? Give away some of the things in your closet and share the food in your fridge. So what does this story mean for us? We should ask two questions, I think. Who are the rich in this story? That's that's important, who are the rich? And number two, what, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us? So let me give you just a couple of quick things as we continue, Um, and and I'll let you decide. Number one, I'm gonna let you decide for yourself who the rich are, um, and then we can go from there. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of stats. We've got a couple of books we've given out many times. Uh, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry is a beautiful one when it comes to slowing down our lives and and, and picking up some of the practices of Jesus. But let me just give you a couple of stats from that book. Um, If you today make over $25,000 a year, you and I, then we're wealthier than 90% of the world population. If your income is over $50,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of the wealthiest people in the world. Currently, 91% of the the world's population does not own a car. Half the world lacks basic sanitation. Two billion people don't have access to clean drinking water. That's roughly one in four people on the planet don't even have access to clean drinking water. 800 million people go to bed hungry every night, and 25,000 people die every day from malnutrition. 10,000 of those people are children. Over one billion people don't have access to electricity. Half the world does not own a computer. Less than 7% of the world's population has a college education. And one billion people on the planet today live on less than a dollar a day. So the question I'm asking is, who are the rich? And as I'm sitting in this with Jesus, he reminds me very simply, Drake, you are the rich young ruler. I've got a car and a faucet in my home that gives me access to clean water at any point in time. I've got more than one car. I've got a motorcycle. I've got a bicycle. I've got a a phone in my pocket and a computer. I've got access to electricity, a house that keeps me warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And over and I just look at my life and I, I am at the uppermost of the world's population when it comes to wealth and possessions. And I came to the simple conclusion that I am the rich young ruler. How's the water? And I don't like being the rich young ruler, quite frankly. Like, oh great, am I supposed to feel bad about it? No, no, listen. As we look at this, 
One, one of the interesting struggles that we have in our culture um, is, it, it, I've, been, I've been following Jesus for a while, I've been a pastor for a while, and we do a lot of counseling, and lots of people come, and you know, they share, hey, here's what I'm struggling with, and I've heard lots of different struggles. The one struggle that, that I have never heard someone just black and white say is, hey, Drake, I'm really struggling with greed. I struggle with the desire for an abundance of stuff and experiences, and I seem to always want more. How's the water? It's the, and, and, and I'll be frank with you, I have also don't know that I've had very many moments in my life where I have come to that conclusion about myself. This is the water. And, and where does it come from? Where, where does this culture of consumerism and materialism come from? I think it comes from fear as we talk about it. This idea that I don't have enough or I am not enough unless I have. And so our culture overpromises and under delivers consistently. Buy more of this and you'll feel better. Have more of this and you'll be more significant. Go on another vacation and you'll finally have the, the rest that you need. This new pair of shoes will make you run faster, jump higher, and go further than any other. Maybe not that one, but you, uh, you know, this, the next best thing is going to help you a little more. Hey, a bottle of this in your cupboard on that stressful day will help. You just take it out at the end of the day. It's going to help you kind of take the edge out. Hey, are you feeling anxious? consume a little more materialism consumerism the pursuit of more in our culture is like the fast food for our souls it's like Taco Bell it'll fill you up but it's not good for you and there's always consequences on the other side <laughs> satisfies for a moment but never always regret right consumerism listen friends consumerism is the default setting of the West it's the water we swim in and I hope that you don't have to go to India to figure that out. Unfortunately, I did. Let me give you a couple other encouraging stats. The average size of the home in America is 40% larger than it was over the last 50 years. The average woman uh, in the United States has 103 items in her closet. In 1930, the, uh, the, that number was nine outfits. 4% of the world's children live in America, yet 30% of the world's toys are consumed by Americans. Our country spends $4 trillion annually on non-essential goods. This is the water. And listen, if, you're, if you get all hung up and if you've been in church and someone talks about money and stuff and you get all weird about it, listen, this is not about poverty versus wealth. This is not an invitation to give away all your stuff and feel really bad. Jesus is after the idea of stewardship here, that what we do with what we have is what matters. Uh, I heard Tyler Staten say it this way, the church in the West started sleeping with the American dream and we are the offspring. This is the water. Money is not, you might have heard it said, money is the root of all evil. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money, Scripture says, is the root of all kinds of evil. It's the competition of the heart. And again, the issue with Jesus in Scripture here is not around wealth. It's around the competition of money and stuff for our hearts. It's around specifically the oppression of the poor and the failure to be generous. And so one of the questions I'm asking is, is does stuff and my desire for more compete with my devotion to God? Do I have more than I need, and, and am I living a generous life? I'm asking those questions. And when I got back from India, what I realized is just those little things, the water that we swim in, it started to distract me again. The pursuit of more, the Black Friday deals, and the, the, the constant scrolling, and the buzzing in your pocket, and the distractions here, the distractions there, and there's just so much opportunity to have more and more and more of whatever your, your poison is, right? You might, we live in Boulder, Colorado, and most of us have, you know, less than a thousand square feet to call home, and so maybe stuff is not your thing, because I, I, I got nowhere to put it. And so instead, it's an icon pass, or it's another trip, another vacation, or it's another this, it's, a, it's the, the experience side of life, whatever it is. We all have a competition in our hearts. And here's, I think, the warning from Jesus today. That casual, unchecked consumption, the pursuit of more, can be dangerous for our souls if we don't watch it. You guys tracking with me? Okay. So if you and I want the life of Jesus, and I think that's it, it's an invitation. If you and I want the life of Jesus, we say it often that we, we, we must adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. And one of the loudest practices from the life of Jesus that we see outside of like silence and solitude is the practice of simplicity. And so we're going to talk about that for just a moment as we wrap up our time. The practice of simplicity. You guys remember that, that quote from Richard Foster, right, we started with? So here's the ending of it. The pace of the modern world accentuates our sense of being fractured and fragmented. We feel strained, hurried, and breathless. The complexity of rushing to achieve and to accumulate more and more threatens frequently to overwhelm us, and it seems that there is no escape from the rat race. Christian simplicity frees us 
from this modern mania. And he goes on. He says, it brings sanity to our compulsive extravagance, peace to our frantic spirit. It allows us to see material things for what they are, goods to enhance life, not to oppress life. People, once again, become more important than possessions. Simplicity enables us to live lives of integrity in the face of the terrible realities of our global village. So as we talk about simplicity, let me give you a couple of quick definitions, and I encourage you, you might write down something that strikes your heart so you can kind of track with what we're talking about today. But this practice, we're all about, again, as we practice the way of Jesus together, it's how do we incorporate something into our lives. It's not about guilt and shame. Like, yeah, I'm rich and I shouldn't be, so see you next week. What? What? How does that help you? No, but is there a practice? Is there something we can do that would shape our hearts, curate us in a way that we actually start to head in the direction of Jesus and his love for us? Yeah, let me show you. Simplicity. This is Richard Foster's definition. definition. The inward reality, simplicity is the inward reality of single-hearted focus upon God and his kingdom, which results in an outward lifestyle of modesty, openness, unpretentiousness, and which disciplines our hunger for status, glamour, and luxury. Dallas Willard said, human desire is infinite. Just a little bit more, and it's still not enough. And listen, everyone in the room has that thing, whatever it is for you. Just a little bit more of X, and I'm finally gonna be at peace or have joy or be significant or be valuable. Listen to Josh Becker's definition, the intentional promotion of the things that we most value and the removal of anything that distracts us from them. Isn't it true that the things that are most valuable are often overlooked? It's so easy to sit down and have a phone take away from the person that's in front of you during a meal or, or to miss a moment because you're so busy and hectic with the day or wrapping up the evening, whether you're single, married, have kids, living solo, empty nesters, no one's immune to this. Listen to Jan Johnson's definition. Intentionally arranging our life around God. It's simple. It's not easy. But it's simple. The invitation, I think, from John in this Christmas story, check your closets and refrigerators, is not earn some gold stars by, by trying to live a minimalist lifestyle. Like that's, that's not what we're after here. But acknowledge maybe some of the clutter around our hearts and our minds, both internally and externally, that's taking away from our devotion to God and love of neighbor. John Mark Homer says it this way, simplicity is limiting the number of our possessions expenses, activities, and social obligations to a level where we are free to live joyfully in the kingdom with Jesus. I love this definition because I think it gives us the scope of what we're talking about, right? Some of you, you don't struggle with materialism the same way that someone else might. Some of you, money and stuff has a different role in your heart and mind. Some of us, it's, it's what people think about us and what all of our things say about us, the job that we have, the titles that we carry. So the invitation today is would we have a willingness to simplify our lives in order to cultivate a priority around the relationships that really matter, the relationships that you really care about, a relationship with God that influences our love of neighbor, that we have the ability to open our eyes to Jesus and, and the good life that he's actually offering because the water that we're swimming in is probably not going away. So I get back from India, and I'm distracted with a thousand different things, and Jesus says, hey, this is the water, but you don't have to swim in it. You don't have to swim in it. So Jesus reminded me, hey, the things that, that, that we were doing over here in India, the, the, where your heart was, where your head was, your attention to me, your attention to others, if you want that, it's available to you. So the question is, do you want it? And the honest answer is sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. And so the practice of simplicity points my heart back to an area that sometimes I'm, I easily miss. So can I give you just a few quick tips on simplicity as we wrap up today, like things you can do this week? Can I give you those? Like you have a choice. I'm going to give them to you anyway. But I'm going to, just thought I'd ask for permission. I thought it'd be better received in that manner. Okay, so really quick, in simplicity, like what are we talking about here? 
in, in a simple way, it, it can be decluttering your life. So one of the, one of the, a couple, I'll just tell you what I've been doing and you can take it from there, okay? We did a practice on this last year and so you can go back and listen to that series. But one of the things I did is I turned my smartphone into a dumb phone. Aha! Uh -huh. You can look, you can like Google, just Google it on your own time. Turn my smartphone into a dumb phone. And so right now you can pick up my phone. It is so boring, guys. It's not even funny. I don't have email. I don't have social media. I mean, I can text message. I can look at the weather. I can follow maps, which is really hard. I turned it into grayscale. Something about dopamine and when you see colors and all the things with your brain and neuroscience and cool things that are smarter than me. Anyway, you turn it into grayscale and it's just like the most boring thing to look at ever. And so you pick up your phone. You're like, wow, that's not, I don't need to look at that anymore. Versus like that weird, anybody ever have that weird uh, ghost tick in your pocket where you think your phone, go, your phone goes off and you pull it out and it's nothing? <gasps> okay. The water is, is getting inside of us in some crazy ways, right? So I turned my smartphone into a dumb phone just to remove distractions. I deleted social media, and some of you are doing that as a fast just for the Advent season, like just a limited time. For me, I'm, I'm doing an effort of practice toward that of just kind of indefinitely, which is frustrating my staff team because they're like, hey, I sent you an email, and I'm like, hey, I can't check it. <laughs> Do I get to a computer? And they're like, oh. Looking at, you know, in my life, like getting rid of anything that doesn't add value or spark joy, right? You can re It's not like Marie Kondo's great, right? But like... Uh, rather than organizing all the stuff that you have, just decluttering your life. But one of the things, this is crazy, and you can hold me accountable to it. I'll let you know how it's going in a year. But last month, I felt like God very clearly said, hey, I want you to take a step back and not make any personal purchases for yourself for the next 12 months. So in the practice of simplicity, listen, guys, I, I don't have time to tell you, but like, I got some crazy, like just the want factor in my heart is always on. Just more, 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 more. It doesn't matter what it is. I just want more of it, right? Like just a little bit more is enough. It doesn't really matter. And so to kill this insatiable desire inside of me for what's next and what's more, I'm taking a step back and no personal purchases outside of like food and drink for the next 12 months. My wife's on, in on it. And that's just my personal practice, okay? So simplicity, what is it for you? It might be decluttering a closet. It might be dumbing down that phone so it quits taking away from the things that matter most. It might be making your phone sleep in another room at night so you don't wake up and touch it the first thing. It might be a, a space of generosity, of giving, whatever it is. As we simplify our lives, it might be the practice of simply beginning to give like to the local church if you're a follower of Jesus. My family, we give a, a, a little over 10% of our income. But maybe you're not ready to start there. Maybe you start at 1% or 5%. You just start the practice of generosity. Or maybe it's, it's beginning to invest in, in, in loving and serving others this season for Christmas. Maybe it's just living by a budget. <laughs> maybe it's just putting limits on how you live. You're like, oh, never thought about that. It's a good one, right? Whatever it is, to aim the infinite desire of your heart toward the only one that can truly satisfy. That's what we're after. And maybe it's given to the Christmas offering. And I'll tell you this. I did not write this message for the Christmas offering. You're welcome. No agenda. This message was done way before that. So, um, listen, some, some of us, you've been pursuing your whole life looking for something to build the void, whatever it is. You're looking for something. And the problem is that while you're looking to material things, what you're, what you're going to find is that that need is going to be found in a different way. It's a spiritual need that material can't satisfy. It's Jesus himself who died to forgive you of sin, to make you new, to give you new life, to make you right with God, to ignite a love for God and neighbor in a way that you can't do for yourself. Now listen, money and possessions can be a really emotional and hard conversation for people. So let me end with this, Mark chapter 10. I don't want you to miss Jesus' words here. When he goes to this young man and he tells him to sell everything he has, look at the posture of Jesus' heart. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then he said, Jesus looked at him. He's not condemning him. He's loving him. He's inviting him. He sees the condition and the competition of this young man's heart. And he knows that the very best thing for him is to open up his hands of the things that are competing with the life that he truly wants. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that we must count the cost of following Jesus because it indeed cost us something. But we must also count the cost of not following Jesus. So wherever you find yourself on your spiritual journey today, I want you to hear the posture of Jesus. It's not condemnation around money and stuff. 
is that there's a good life on the other side of it. When we simplify our hearts and our minds, we find that there's more margin to love God, to love people, and to receive the love of God and give it to the world around us. He looks at him, and he looks at you, and he loves you. The invitation is for the life that you long for. So there's a gentle nudge from Jesus today, at least it's been that way in my heart, to step into the practice of simplicity in a season of materialism and consumerism and busyness and Christmas parties and the next thing, and just breathe a little bit and evaluate what matters most. So a couple of next steps for you and I. Number one, ask God. Just this question this morning, and I'd encourage you, wherever you are, write down the things that God is, God is speaking to you. Otherwise, you really just roll into, you'll roll into Monday and have nothing. <laughs> You're like, it's a really good day, I think. And that's all you got. So, as we listen to the Holy Spirit today, ask, where do I need to simplify to make more room for you and others? That's the simple question. And you let Him reveal the things that are important in your mind and your heart and your life today. Number two, join the Advent fast. Either combine it with this practice, or if, you, if you're, you know, first week or whatever, you missed last week's intro, it's not too late, jump in. Set up the practice. Maybe it's just no social media. Maybe it's no food. Sun up, sundown, Wednesdays and Fridays. Whatever your thing would be to curate a hunger in your heart toward God and a love for others. Number three, the Christmas offering. Reflect, pray, and invest. You have a couple of weeks to do that. Begin to consider, God, how do you want me to be a part of that? Is that the last one? Hey, there we go. Cool. And lastly, let me invite you. Listen, as we simplify, it, it creates space in our lives. But then we have the privilege, this light that came into the world. Jesus then, as he makes our lives new, he sends us out into the world. He says, you are the light of the world. And so you and I have the privilege, as we live simple lives, to love others in profound ways. And so I want to invite you to invite others to join you for Christmas Eve at City Church, whether you're in person, online, wherever you are. If you're at home, grab your favorite smelly good candle and gather around the TV and then do a candle lighting with your family, like whatever it is. Or join us in person. It's going to be cool. All those spaces are great. If you're traveling, you've got family that doesn't go to church, I mean, you can do that together as a practice. But don't underestimate the power of a simple invitation from you this Christmas season. And I think it means a lot when you personalize an invite, you just hand them a card, you write their name on a card, you stamp it with a wax seal, which is just old school and cool, and just, hey, I care about you. That's what that says. So wherever you are, take some time to reflect, but here's what I would encourage you to do. God, what do you want me to do today in response to what I've heard? And write it down and tell somebody so there's some accountability in your life to see this margin and make a difference. Let me pray for you. God, thank you. For our church. Thank you for the privilege of gathering. Thank you um, for how, how easy it is um, <laughs> to miss the life that is true to life, but also how, how gentle you call us back to it. Thank you for loving us. And in love, you call us to something better. And I pray for my friends in the room. Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us. What is it that you want us to do to declutter our hearts and our lives? I'm so grateful for the things that you told me to do and how they've created margin. And I feel like I'm slowly getting back to an attentiveness to you that I lost in the middle of the rat race. And some of my friends, their lives are cluttered, their minds are cluttered, their hearts are cluttered, their lives are busy. Some of those things they have control over, some of them they don't. So Jesus, would you help us to press into the practice of simplicity, the things we can control, and find a little bit more margin to receive and give the love of God. For my friends in the room who maybe are not followers of you, I pray that the loudest reality today would be your love for them, that you look at us and you love us, and in that love you invite us into new life. So Jesus, as we sing, as we worship, as we respond, would you speak today? It's in Jesus' name. Amen.